There is a very, very powerful human connection to storytelling on a, on a level that scales. A story can move millions of people and you can reach millions of people and inspire millions of people to do something if you've got the right product, the right message and, and the right output. And so I've seen it work. I know that marketing works and it doesn't always work, but if you have those right ingredients of the right product, the right message and the right output, like you can do great things in this world. Aloha, and welcome to another episode of the Groundswell Origins podcast, where I connect you to outstanding humans and sustainable ideas. I'm your host, Scott Martin. Today, we're going to be meeting with uh, Sherry Cohen. She's the Chief Revenue Officer at the World, currently at the uh, World Surf League, and uh, is that over a decade with ESPN, worked with NBC, um, Universal Media, and has predominantly been working within sports media marketing and has a deep background in business marketing, revenue, revenue streams, partnerships, and so many things that we talk about, uh, um, you know, for everything from the X Games to the Triple Crown to, I mean, the amount of stuff that she's covered and be able to work with. And what's really interesting is if you look at an audience, and if we're in marketing, we're trying to build an audience, she's someone that really understands audience attention, syndication, activation, and we talk about all those things and so much more. So without further ado, let's paddle in. We're paddling into another episode. We have the one and only Sherry Cohen. Welcome to the show. Thank you, one and only. That's a great intro. Is there any other? I mean, it's really the Groundswell Origins podcast. It's shifted from that, from the Groundswell Marketing. I'm looking for the original originators, the original people. So You got us. So welcome to the show. We were just talking before we started recording, and I wanted to you know share with the guests a little bit about who you are, you know, from... The moment that I sort of, you came on my radar when I saw this person called Chief Revenue Officer of what is pretty much the the biggest group around the surfing industry that you can imagine. And I'm like, what in the world is this? Because normally you see CEO, Chief Marketing Officer. So tell me a little bit about first the role and the company you're working with. And then I want to touch in a little bit on how you got there. Yeah, of course. Um, and it's been a, a really wild experience, um, I must say. So we can talk at length about uh, lots of lots of those stories. Um, but just to back up, I've been here for uh, two years. I came to the league in 2019. Um, and I'll get into kind of what motivated me to make that change and, and why I saw there was a really big opportunity here at the World Surf League, both professionally and personally. But I am the Chief Revenue Officer of the World Surf League, which means I'm in charge of uh, implementing strategies that will help sustain the long-term growth of the sport Uh, from certainly, you know, a financial standpoint, but also uh, from a partnerships um, and relationship standpoint. Does that make sense? It makes more than sense. I mean, that's the whole topic of this podcast, which is sustainable growth marketing. Doubles down how interesting that that's actually what you're coming in to do. So I think this is going to be lots of discussion about like, what are you doing to actually do that? People are keen to know. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about the World Surf League? Sure. The World Surf League is the governing body of professional surfing. And we do work with other NGOs around the world. Um, But essentially, our biggest job each year is to crown undisputed men's and women's championships uh, across shortboarding, longboard, um, and big wave surfing. Um, And so we are responsible for the professional ecosystem of the sport of surfing. Sometimes I liken us to other leagues like the NBA of surfing for people who maybe don't know what uh, we do, but we're we're also much different. Uh, Our our organization is uh, owned privately. So uh, we own the ecosystem and have aggregated the professional surfing ecosystem around the globe. 
under one organization, which is quite different than, you know, other sports and leagues. Yeah. And then, and you also have this other little piece, which is really cool, which is you have these almost like shows that are part of it. Is that correct? Like you have um, the new ultimate yeah. surfer that's coming out, right? We have a fully functioning studio um, that supports the league. Um, and of course there are tours and competitions um, and sort of athlete development side of the business. Um, and then of course there is our content and distribution. Um, and so we have a, a fully functioning world-class studio that is producing for our platform as well as our partners platforms. Um, and the goal of that studio is to promote um, the sport of surfing. Is is um, were you guys involved also in the the? I think I just saw it on on uh, HBO. The hundred foot wave is that part of what you guys are doing as well? That support. Um, I love that. I mean, I was a big fan of that documentary. Um, they are a partner of ours because they have advertised to our audience, um, but we're not a production partner on that show. So, in terms of off platform shows that you uh, recognize and just referenced, um, we're actually in the market right now with a reality television show with ABC called The Ultimate Surfer. Um, and that premiered last night, in fact. Um, and you can watch it. Uh, again tonight and next week, Monday and Tuesday, um, for the next several weeks. Uh, that was filmed at our Wave facility, uh, the Kelly Slater Wave Ranch in Lemoore, California, uh, that uh, we own and operate. Um, and uh, that is a, a big bet for the U.S. television audience. Um, the contestants of that reality show are competing for a you know a hundred thousand dollars and uh, a wild card on the WSL Championship Tour. Um, and, uh, that, that helps us to, uh, reach more people, um, build awareness for the sport and, um, certainly, um, inspire young athletes to get excited about a professional career in surfing. Um, and we've done, you're underscoring, um, go ahead. Yeah, no, we, we've done a lot of other off platform, um, series and shows that have been super successful, but that's the one that's in the market right now. And probably the biggest um, of names, but we also produce tons of, of content for our own platform and YouTube channel and Facebook, etc. So that's just extraordinary. I mean, you're just underscoring the complexity that you're managing, and, and I want to actually use this as a as a as a footnote. You know, the fact that it's a show. You have a background in television syndication, and that could you share with us a little bit of your background that led to this role? And then I want to do a deep dive on all the stuff that you're doing. The like the the surf ranch, like people don't know what that is. We need to tell them about that and so forth. But just to give them a little context that we got them here, because what, what I'm, what I'm hearing anyways, is this is someone's story that is just absolutely managing what I believe is a future ecosystem that most businesses can take. This is a big scale, but I want to see the lessons that we can take for most businesses that can, they can take from, because you guys are diversified like crazy, which I love. So I want to hear more about that. So why don't you tell us a little bit what got you here? Yeah, and you touched on a word that I use a lot, which is diversification, um, especially as the chief revenue officer. I think we should unpack that a little bit in a bit because Please. we both agree on that um, completely. Um, what brought me here? So I spent the better part of 20 years in media, sports, entertainment, uh, both East Coast and West Coast. I'm born and bred in New Jersey. Um, they do surf out in New Jersey. <laughs> Mass I've surfed in New Jersey. In um, fact, just a quick side note, I actually surfed with a blind surfer in New Jersey. Excellent. Episode uh, 11 or 12 or something, Sean Callagy, he's one of the top lawyers in North America. He's a, he's actually now the president of the Blind Foundation, and um, he surfs. I went surfing with him, and he surfed better than I did. Oh, my God. I would he's love blind. to meet him. Super inspiring. Um, that's amazing. Maybe there's a connection um, there. Side note. Side note. Um, I will say, because this is going to be a lot of, of, of information, but I, I absolutely am very, very interested in learning more about adaptive surfing um, and adaptive surfing um, potentially being part of the Olympic Games, because I do think um, after having been exposed to some really, really great adaptive surfers, that there is no sense of mobility quite like surfing for uh, folks with disabilities. Um, so I'm really, really interested in seeing where that that goes in the future. And, I love uh, the inclusion. Love yeah, it. Me, me too. Um, but back to me. <laughs> um, I spent the better part of 20 years um, in entertainment and sports. I was a young kid out in uh, New York working for an ad agency um, and worked on some big blue chip accounts um, in my 20s. 
um, and was called on by one of my clients to come out to Los Angeles for the first time um, in 2000 to work at Paramount Pictures. So that was my first sort of real entertainment job. I went to the studio to be in the marketing department of a major theatrical company um, and was probably the bedrock of learnings um, in my career. Um, A really, really important time and a really important experience um, for me that has uh, influenced every part of my career. Um, Movie marketing and entertainment marketing um, is just such a, an amazing discipline. Um, and what do you find like what do you find most exciting about it? Well, first of all, I love entertainment and I love the human need for entertainment and I love the you know both the psychological need uh, for storytelling in the in the world in the, in the marketplace um, and you know great product always delivers. Um, and so uh, the job of a movie marketer is to create uh, relevance and awareness for intellectual property that is um, usually unknown unless it's a sequel or a, you know, a, a franchise um, in a short period of time and to break through culture um, and to learn how to break through culture in meaningful ways, meaningful and efficient ways, um, you know, relative to your marketing budget and strategies. Um, and so I learned a lot about how to break through culture different types of mediums and messages, um, what types of stories drive people, what motivates um, entertainment, um, and um, all of those things. And then I sort of took that experience and I continued to evolve my my career. Uh, My next significant job was with ESPN for nine years, um, where I worked um, with uh, that team across all of their platforms. And in that job, I think I learned a lot about sports marketing, what motivates sports fans, what motivates, um, you know, sports uh, marketers. And then I also learned a lot about multi-platform engagement um, because we were, work- at the time, one of the first organizations to work across multiple platforms, whether that was television, broadcast, cable, um, even Spanish language, radio, print, out of home, events. Um, And uh, I worked with partners um, on partnerships across platforms and and learned a tremendous amount of information about how to measure and market and develop meaningful programs um, across an ecosystem of content. Um, And of course, got to to work in some really cool sports, um, had a fun time with college football and the NFL and NBA and um, all the more domestic, uh, big domestic sports that you know and love, as well as things like the X Games. Uh, the X Games is always near and dear to my heart. My brother was a BMX kid growing up. My husband uh, was a surfer from the age of five in Long Island up. And so um, I just culturally have always been around people who love what we'll call action sports um, and always love them myself. Um, so that was an, an amazing experience for those nine years. I was then recruited to go to NBC Universal um, to work across an even bigger platform uh, and portfolio. Um, that was an organization that was pulling all of their networks and uh, digital products together under one roof. I think we had seven different cable networks, a couple of broadcast networks, some relationships with leagues like we represented the NHL. Uh, media inventory, news networks, Spanish language, um, et cetera. And I was in charge of managing relationships across that entire portfolio. And to me, that really like blended my experience for entertainment and sports back together under one roof. Um, Very, very exciting time. We did some great, great work um, and broke some ground with uh, technology partners, entertainment partners, automotive partners. um, And, I was a big part of um, their strategy um, for the you know better half of the last 13 years because I was representing all of their partnerships on the West Coast, um, which is rich with a lot of those companies I mentioned. But I eventually got to a place where having had a front seat um, in media and entertainment and two young kids could see the changes in, in behavior and consumption and um, engagement 
and um, kind of realized that um, I could probably contribute more to an organization um, that had that was uh, in a building phase as opposed to a very big mature media company that had a lot of legacy um, holding it back. Um, not to say they aren't a great successful company, but for me personally, I was ready to contribute in a, in a different way. And I was at this funny crossroads in my personal and professional life where I was um, really wanting to be a contributing member of a team, right? And I also wanted and was calling for more purpose in my life and my work. And when I met the folks at the World Surf League and I understood, got to understand their values and their vision and purpose for the company long term, um, and I could see the momentum that the sport um, clearly had, I thought, well, wow, this is a this is a perfect challenge for me. And I got to meet lots of new global friends. This is my first global role, so that's been exciting for me as well. And so between you know expanding my role um, outside of the U.S. to to be, become more global and marrying some of my passion and purpose with um, a, a, a product and a sport that I think just has so much potential. I, I couldn't say no. I literally couldn't say no. <laughs> so I took the I, leap and here I've been for a couple of years. I, I was on the, the world surf league site and the about, I love the statement. It's like established 1976, the global home of surfing is dedicated to changing the world through the inspirational power of surfing by creating authentic events, experiences and storytelling to inspire a growing global community to live with purpose, originality, and stoke. I love that statement. It's like, it's like, that's me. I love it. And that, and I can hear that from you. Like that's your, the connection that you're, you're making is you finally found a, a really great place to connect with your purpose. What is your purpose? So I think my ultimate purpose, if I were to define it today, and I, you know, keep trying to refine it and define it is, um, you know, to, first of all, to leave the sport better than I found it whenever, whenever that might be, hopefully that's not anytime soon. And I mean, the athletes, the people, the institution, um, the sustainability of the professional sport of surfing, um, inspire a lot of young kids to live a more healthy lifestyle and, um, follow their passion and then contribute meaningfully um, to the conversation and the action around climate, um, and, you know, our, our planet and, then, and, and, and help to inspire companies to do better, um, by being our partner. Um, and so that's kind of long winded, but those are the things that I'm focused on today. And I'm sure I will continue to refine that and maybe even level up that goal. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love it. You know, when you were doing your movie, you said movie marketing, I actually have some background in I was a partner in a company called Media Circus, which was, uh, you might have heard of Circus Road Films. They did a lot of indie films. And and uh, so Glenn Reynolds, I ended up partnering in that business and started Indie Popcorn and we we're marketing films. And I actually um, I left the relationship because I actually was, I loved it on one hand, but what I couldn't get over was the lack of sustainability in market. I couldn't actually systemize anything. You can't treat every movie is different and, and there's all these different moving parts, budgets and placement and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, in your sort of like quest for sustainability and growth, what did you learn from your experience? Because for me, I was like, the one thing I took away was the ability to succinctly explain what the story is and the importance of it by borrowing from other movies. <laughs> That's what I learned from Glenn, which is it's sort of like Star Wars meets, you know, sound of music and this, you know, and that's the way to kind of explain it to somebody. And I'm like, that was probably my biggest takeaway. But other than that, I found it incredibly difficult. I mean, I eventually left too. And I think for me, I also found it there incredibly is difficult. A very, very, you know, how some, some of the underlying agendas and, and politics um, on a, um, on a back in the day in the, in the major movie studio uh, millions organizations were, were challenging, and right? And they maybe weren't focused on some of those things we're talking about and inspire uh, sustainability. It was about cutting corners um, at all costs. The right product, <laughs> um, right message. But, um, 
what and, I did and take away work. from it is um, that so there is I've a very, work. very I know that powerful works. human connection um, to storytelling. Mm-hmm. It doesn't um, on a work. on a level that um, scales. But if you have those a story can move right millions of people. Right message and the right outcome. and like, you, you can, can things things reach well. millions of people and inspire millions of people to do something um, if you've got the right product, the right message, um, and, and the right output. Um, and so I've seen it work. I know that marketing works, um, and it doesn't always work. Um, but if you have those right ingredients of the right product, the right message, and the right output, like you can do great things in this world. So I think I, I, I take that away. Do you like with now being in surfing content? I mean, surfing content is like, I mean, most people would say, you know, it's like you could just throw a rock and it's going to be successful. I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, you know, because it's such a vibrant sport. It's so rich and so forth. What's sort of the challenges that people wouldn't expect from what you're doing? You know, because I think some people think, oh, well, it's surfing. Just put it on TV and it's all going to work, you know. Yeah, exactly. And I think <laughs> Your facial that, expression yeah. said it all. <laughs> no, and, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of like actually articulating a, a core challenge of ours, which is on the one hand, Mother Nature is wildly exciting. Right. And fans all over the world are tuning into swell and, you know, surf line and other, you know, sort, sorts of tools to, to track swell and are very interested in the weather patterns and what that does to our ocean and how that affects their, you know, lifestyle and, 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 uh, you know, leisure. Right. Um, and all of that is super exciting and can be harnessed. But on the other hand, You know, right now, the format for professional surfing um, is dependent on, you know, sort of like Mother Nature. We call the competition on. It usually runs about four days out of a 10-day period. Um, We are running competitions in global markets. Um, So our fans are, you know, tuning in from different time zones and on different platforms. So for me, like the puzzle is no doubt is surfing and content in and around the ocean and, um, you know, the athleticism of our athletes, like no doubt is all of that very, very compelling. Um, but we can't, we can't be single minded about it. There isn't one format that is perfect. Um, you know, and there are lots of different ends, uh, in terms of distribution to the end consumer. And so, Um, I think we've got to really get savvy about um, sort of like what is a full competition? What is the content that comes off of the full competition? How do we also tell stories about the athletes in and outside of the jersey um, and, you know, humanize their stories um, and inspire the younger generation? Um, And so there's lots of there's lots of different formats that we need to consider in and around Uh, producing professional surfing, including the actual competition itself that can be optimized and refined, um, which is something that, I I mean, that's what I think about a lot. Like Mm -hmm. I think about, for example, we're in Mexico um, in our last competition, the the Corona Mexico Open. Which looked awesome. (laughs) Awesome, beautiful spot, right? Like very remote, very hard to bring connection to. Um, And so we obviously live stream the event and we also offer that live stream to our global linear partners around the world. And, you know, some of which play live, some of which play on rear um, and some of which play the highlight show. Right. So I'm obsessing about when I'm in Mexico, what's happening in Australia, because I've got a third of my fan base who isn't up yet. And so how am I communicating to them? Where am I sending them? And once I send them somewhere, what are they, what are they seeing? And how are we, you know, creating an ecosystem so that our fan base can grow um, and deliver our partners uh, value? Um, And right now our business model is, you know, largely driven upon, you know, things like media rights and sponsorship revenue and ad sales and licensing of content Uh, to some small degree ticketing and merchandise. Merchandise has been a big uh, mainstay of surfing, um, surf apparel Mm -hmm. um, for decades. But, um, you know, 
I don't want to take anything for granted either, just because something was a, a certain way doesn't need, mean it needs to be that way forever. Um, and so ultimately it always comes down to the intentions of what's best for the sport mm-hmm. and what's best for the next generation of athletes. How do you, how do you deal with that ecosystem you just described, right? Like you have the, the, the two different time zones. How do you address those ecosystems differently? And then you talked about all the, the complexity you have, which is all the multi-channel syndication. The one thing I will 100% say you guys, you do so well, and I'm curious how you do it, how you approach it, is a lot of uh, media platforms, they basically do like homogenous um, uh, syndication. So if I'm on Twitter, I get the same thing whether I'm there on Instagram. It doesn't feel different. And I'm like, why am I even over here? You don't do yeah. that. I feel like it's totally different ecosystems. Tell me about that. Like, how did you come up with that? Like, or is that, was that, is it a happy accent or is that actually intentional? Like, like, and how, yeah. how do you deal with very, someone from Australia versus people in North America? Like, how are you addressing that? Yeah, no, I think it's very intentional. And I think we're not even anywhere near done in perfecting that model, right? Like, and so our major markets are Brazil, uh, US, Australia, parts of Europe, and some parts of Asia. And so I would say we'd spend most of our time talking about the top four because that makes up the majority of today's fan base and audience, Brazil, Mm -hmm. U.S., Australia, and and parts of Europe. And there is a lot of nuance in that because we're talking about multiple languages, um, you know, Portuguese, uh, you know, uh, English, um, to some degree Spanish. Um, You're talking about different platforms. Um, you know, free to air in, in, in Australia on Channel 7 is much different than I'm making it up Fox Sports here in the United States. Um, you know, and, and not wholly different, but like different nuances. Um, and, you know, then there are new platforms and emerging platforms. Um, like you mentioned, some of the social media platforms, in, in, in particular for us, a place like TikTok. TikTok has been wildly successful for us. We were one of the first sports to stream live on TikTok. And, you know, it was, it was not a heavy lift in terms of the technology and it, it, we still have to invest some money in, in terms of what we want to do there from a bespoke feed perspective. But um, there was a conversation that needed to happen. Like, is, is this a priority? Why would we do this? And, you know, um, for us, a platform like TikTok offers us access to younger fans um, who are not watching live streams on you know wsl.com or their linear uh cable network and uh it's just as important for us to engage and reach you know the full spectrum of our audience and our fan base um and so i think um it is complicated because you're dealing with different platforms different time zones um and you know sort of different um universes uh, in each each region, as well as different languages, but you have to prioritize. Like you have to learn each market, know which platforms are succeeding in those markets. Uh, for example, we know that Globo is a major player in Brazil, right? So, what's our relationship with Globo, and what is Globo's appetite to stream our our program live versus um, not because of you know uh, the fact that we're hard to program on linear television. Um, mm-hmm. So we, we and I use Global as an example. We actually work with ESPN down there as well. But just using so some, the, the the reason it's hard to stream is that because the the contests there's some wiggle room because of weather or what is the what is the nuance there that everybody needs to understand? Yeah, so there there is there's something um, called a window in surfing, and this is only when we're at the beach. If we were at a wave pool, this would be like less of an issue. We'll talk um, about that can, later. <laughs> Yeah. But so let's say we're at the beach and we're um, we're set to have a, a, a competition and I'm uh, making it up to Tahiti or Huntington Beach. Um, we get our permits and we, we mostly compete on state parks, right? Um, for the for the most part, we get our permits and we start to build out um, our operation. And uh, you know we have a ten day waiting period um, in terms of uh, picking the swell within that ten day period that is most contestable. And so usually within 24 hours, and we've been getting even better and better at this through science, 
and relationships with like folks like Surfline um, is, you know, we can see when the swell is coming in maybe three days in advance. We, you know, hope to predict the window um, that we're going to start running. And, you know, we usually try to pick the very best conditions within that, within that, those 10 days. That's very easy. I want to say it's very easy, but it's sort of easy to alert a global fan base that you're on um, through social media and um, digital media, if you will. Um, But linear television networks are scheduled um, by time period. And so um, our linear partner here in the United States, Fox, um, has to make time for us and be flexible. And, you know, sometimes we get preempted. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we preempt other people. Um, But I think, um, you know, our live product is really probably best suited for a digital and social environment. But our, let's say, our uh, post-produced cut-down shows and highlights do very, very well in television. Um, and so, for example, Fox here in the United States is going to be running a uh, WSL, a, a Rip Curl WSL Finals preview show um, on Big Fox, Fox Broadcasting, uh, on, on, at noon on September 5th to pre-promote the finals um, because it's a, something they know they will have in advance. It's pre-produced. Um, it's easy to schedule. It gets the best time slot. When we're talking about handing over a live feed within 24 hours, um, it gets more challenging. So that, but that live feed for sure, like when you're doing it on the internet, I know that when I catch a live, you know, uh, feed or whatever, if it's even, even not on, you have a live feed and you're talking about like, Hey, we're checking the weather, but on syndicated on TV, you can't do that. Like they need something specific to do it. So the cool thing is the innovation that you guys have partnered with Kelly Slater with his wave pool is these new surf parks that could change everything because you have that now it's flipped. So can you explain the um, sort of, I guess the rationale why you guys got into that? What is a surf park? And we touched on the, the, the mo- the show that you're, you're launching in ABC. Uh, it's ABC, right? Did I get that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And ABC. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about this chasm or this new world that we're, we're about to experience? Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's been it's been kind of developing pretty steadily since I want to say 2013. Um, wave pool technology and um, technology across the globe, actually. In well, when people hear wave pools, they think like the little pools that they're used to. We're not talking about that. We're talking full fledged right. barrels, full grade waves, right? And there's yeah. really only one right now in the world that is of the championship tour professional grade level. And that was developed uh, by Kelly Slater with scientists from USC and ocean engineering and all kinds of um, engineers and and scientists. And um, it is a phenomenal uh, experience. Um, It's a training facility, a production facility, um, an event facility, um, and also just a, you know, consumer hospitality experience, um, which um, is, very actively used um, here in the United States, but there are wave pools around the world that have been developed by other um, technologies, um, and they are, you know, growing by by the year. Um, I know that there there was one that was reported in in, in Japan during the Olympics, um, where the U- Team USA was practicing from. That was you know a, a really great experience for them. They got some great practice in before they had to surf the waves um, in Chiba. Um, and, um, it's been, it's been a growing phenomenon. I think it's not going away. It will only get better, um, less expensive to produce, more sustainable, um, all of those things. Um, and, um, I think, um, it will make for great entertainment, um, in the future. Um, it does now, um, through our, you know, our, our events that we hold and broadcast from, from wave facilities Stab does some stuff from wave facilities as well. Um, and I, do you I, own I, that I do. technology? Cause I thought I saw an acquisition. We do. We do. We own um, the, the Kelly Slater wave ranch and the underlying technology and our inactive conversations about developing new pools around the world. So we're super excited about that. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, our fans love it. 
And anyone who's been to a, a, a wave facility, particularly at that level, if you're surfing at that level and training at that level, um, it's a, it's an amazing experience. I don't ever see a world where surfing doesn't include the ocean. I mean, it's inherent in what we do, but I think it will give more surfers the opportunity to surf in parts of the country where they can't get to uh, the coast um, and or give more opportunity for programmability and scheduling, you know, big events. Do you, do you foresee a future where there'll be a world tour of surf pools? I mean, I, there's not enough of them now to make that compelling um, and mm-hmm. to give enough variety, but I, I don't rule anything out for sure. Um, uh, absolutely could be, could be an option at some point in time. Um, I think what is inherent in, in, in surfing and the surf lifestyle is also travel. Um, so we're deeply connected to cultures around the world and, you know, beach cultures around the world um, and those communities and those indigenous communities. And so um, I do think that um, we have to consider that. Like if we ever went to a fully wave pool only model, like how do we serve that part of, um, you know, the, the, the interest and fan base. Um, but I, I see for a, a long period of time, it'll be a combination of probably, a, you know, a smaller percentage of the championship tour stops, um, but maybe growing over time. How has COVID affected your business? Oh, Lord. Well, how has COVID affected everyone? Let's start there. Like, for sure. I mean, just- yeah across the board. Like I'm a mom, I have two kids for the better part of, I don't know, I, I forget because I probably tuned it out. 15 months I was helping to homeschool and motivate kids from home and, and stealing away to get in front of my Zoom and keep my job, uh, you know, um, in front of mind and, and, and top of mind with all the backdrop of uncertainty and political unrest um, of the world. I mean, I think it's been challenging for everybody uh, as human to human. Right. And we're still dealing with some uncertainty, which is anxiety driving. Like, you know, it's hard to to live amongst an environment where we don't know if we're making progress or we're, you know, at at, at risk. Right. Um, And there's lots of new information by day. Um, And for for our sport, um, we are a global sport and we travel athletes around the globe. And so that has become more complex. Um, and um, ultimately, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're really lucky that we're owned by the people who do own us because um, there's never anything we have to do that would put anyone at risk or would, you know, we would never have to make a financial decision if it was the wrong thing to do. We're lucky. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that's the most sustainable business model like moving forward, meaning we need to make sure that we've got a, a good financial engine that can be executed. <laughs> well, but I'd say that's a very good sustainable philosophy because that outlasts some of these like short-term decision-making when people around you can count on the principle-based you know direction that you're in. I think that's sustainable. Yeah, yeah. No, so I, I – and I see other organizations and I have friends who work at some of those major – leagues and organizations and they don't always have that luxury. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I think that we're very considerate about considerate about who we partner with. We're very considerate about our athlete safety. Um, and we're very considerate about the message we're sending to the next generation of fans and youth. And so if something is not aligned there and there's more risk than there is reward, we're not going to do it. Um, and, uh, I think we're very clear in our values there. And sometimes that hurts us financially, no doubt. And that's painful for me. Um, but I think the folks who partner with us understand that our values are rock solid and almost everybody we have partnered with us has been with us for some time and or stays with us over time because of that. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a positive. What was sure. like, was there an innovation that came out of COVID? Cause I feel like that's usually the, there's always like, yeah, it's been difficult, but I guess 
you know, from, you know, the fact that like for me anyways, I'm like, you would think the content of, of people surfing destinations is gone up because people are like, get me out of here. I want to just escape and see what it's like out in the world. You know, I mean, what innovations have you experienced or what changes or trends have um, altered and kind of like now this is a new direction? Yeah, I would say there's a couple of innovations um, that I can point to. One would be um, work from home, right? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, that's a simple one that everybody has experienced. But we, we ran a global, a global sports league from home um, successfully. No one would have ever thought we would be, be able to do that. And, and I think that we pivoted um, very quickly and were able to, you know, align and become really a, a, a a, a productive unit across the globe in a short amount of time. So I'm really proud of that. Um, secondly, I think that we've um, really spent a lot of time on the format for the professional, you know, tours and competitions um, and made some significant changes to them, which would have been hard to do while the machine is moving. We actually changed the entire season for the championship tour. Not sure if you fully um, were aware of that or recognize that as a fan, but we used to run from March to December, and now we are running from January to September. Um, and there was a lot of analysis and data and discussion around that and why that was a more sustainable long term. And we worked a lot on the development path um, to clarify what is the qualifying series, what is the challenger series, what is the path to pro. Who needs to re-qualify, you know, after the final event? And how do they do that? And what do we do with athletes that can't travel around the globe? And can they qualify regionally? And can we create a, a, you know, a sustainable regional strategy that will help more young athletes participate, not less? Um, We did see a huge boom in participation for the sport. And so it's our job to provide the ramp um, to, to a livelihood. Um, and so a lot of work been put into the, the format of the sport, the seasonality of the sport, some of the rules and regulations, um, and working on new technologies in the sport, things like wearable technology and, and, um, and such. Um, and so really trying to advance the format. Will that, the will that is somehow the wearable technology, will that somehow be a revenue stream of some kind, or is that just an innovation? More to come, more to come. Um, I, I think that anything that I touch is, is supposed to become a revenue stream. I think so, it could, like if you have like a wearable wetsuit, you can actually see how fast he's paddling in real time. Like in baseball, like you can see the last pitch and stuff. I, I always thought that, that, you know, more intimate metrics for fans is always so interesting. Right. Very interesting. And that's, that's another thing is like demystifying the conditions under which these athletes surf is like another key core part of the storytelling right like we we need to we need to let the world know just how 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 special these people are um i like to i like to say our our athletes are almost like astronauts meet you know elite athletes right meet gymnasts like they're they're competing in very dynamic conditions in a part of the environment that most people don't understand um with geography and you know, uh, threats in, in the ecosystem and they're highly athletic, um, and, you know, have skills that most humans don't, but like the more our fans can see what the bottom of the ocean looks like at pipe and understand what, like what's on the line for these athletes or, you know, can understand the currents, um, and how strong they are and, you know, how difficult it is to swim against them. All, all these things that, you know, um, sort of demystify the sport it, it, and, and technology can obviously help that. And, and yeah, I'm, like I'm, lifting I'm, the veil behind the scenes is a great storytelling. It's a great content marketing lesson for anyone listening that, you know, sharing that story. The one connection I think a lot of people are, are also curious about, especially me, is that veil of the content market. A lot of people are telling the story. They're they're in their business. They're 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 unveiling, demystifying like the ingredients and all things like that. Like that that's to me is like an ingredient reveal. But how do you make revenue? Like where does content marketing translate into revenue 
um, outside of sponsorship, like what are some of the innovations you're seeing in, in sort of like your syndication content and modeling that would be really interesting for people to really think about differently in how they tell their story? Because not unlike the World Surf League, you have individual athletes, you've got the story of the, the championship tour and, and all these experiences. Other businesses have, you know, a muffin shop and they have employees and they're the heroes and stuff like how could they learn from what you're doing in terms of how to turn that into revenue? Well, I mean, like we're in the business of selling audience um, and intellectual property, right? And two fans who are passionate about a lifestyle and, and a fan base. And there are a number of different buyers um, you know, for that audience and or intellectual property. It could be, like you said, sponsorship and ad sales is an obvious, um, you know, fit. And there are lots of companies over decades and decades who have leveraged the lifestyle to sell product. We, we all see it every day. Um, it's sort of a known entity, actually. Um, and then there is, you know, selling direct to your consumer, um, some form of content experience and or, you know, merchandising. Um, so, and, and that, that continues to evolve with things like NFTs and um, new technologies and ways to super serve, you know, fans, uh, frankly. Um, and then there's, you know, intellectual property, footage, licensing, um, all of that stuff um, that has a great big marketplace around the world, um, you know, and we should per- be participating in that, you know, in that arena in a very healthy way. Um, but there are other ideas um, as well um, that have circulated around the league in terms of, you know, training um, and wellness and, um, you know, all kinds of fitness, um, you know, programs and aspects to our business that could be interesting models for us as well. Um, and, you know, ultimately, um, you know, we're working on all of them actively. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're considering them all. We're considering what's happening in the betting marketplace. We have a relationship this year with DraftKings for the first free to play game, dipping our toe in the water, understanding more about, you know, what our fans are betting on in Australia, um, where they do actively bet on the, on the sport. Um, we're looking at, you know, all kinds of different markets, um, related to, um, how to operate and monetize the intellectual property and content that we produce. What's your, like, so pretty much as the chief revenue officer, are you like, you're just open to hearing everything. How do you vet what to do? Like, what's your strategy for identifying, identify and differentiate what options you do? And then, I I mean, I'm baffled by the amount of complexity you manage and partners. How do you determine then to create a relationship that's beneficial for both of you? Do you have like a little bit of a breakdown of like your core sort of process for for identifying and doing that? Always, the, yeah. Always I mean, there's the here and the now, right? Like your immediate right? goals, and, and I you know, think always blocking and tackling. Same, the, like, the what do we need to accomplish true. this season? Um, um, what does success look like in movie marketing? How does the sport the become sustainable you, this season? Where um, they and you know, who are the partners in place that media um, on? and relationships in place that can help us get there immediately? But then, always, we always have to be thinking two, three, four, five years out, right? And places I think this is the same that the same holds do that true. Regularly, you know, where um, go. as the lessons um, that I learned in movie marketing, clear. the um, audience so I think will we tell you kind of a regular where they want to be, audience behavior, what platforms they're consuming media markets. on, what's most um, interesting to them, and, and kind of if you pay attention to the needs of our sport, uh, the data that you website. can measure, or the cues that your audience are giving you, or the places they are aggregating. And do that regularly, you know where to go. Um, it becomes pretty clear. Um, so I think we have to do c- kind of a regular review of audience behavior in each of these markets um, and kind of match that with the needs of our sport and what growth looks like. I mean, growth looks like to us more fan surfing. Um, and I know some people are against that because of, you know, hyper localism and. Um, you know, sort of, um, you know, just uh, the, the nature of the, the history of, of our sport, but um, it means more, 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 more kids, more, 
more fans, more people surfing and more, more people tuning in and interested in be watching or becoming a professional surfer. Why does um, getting yeah. more people surfing, why is that important outside of more fan base? Well, because you don't get to the elite level of surfing. Like it, it's a, it, like a, an elite surfer is probably one. And I, I, I'm, Somebody would say you're wrong on that statistic, but it's I'm, I'm just one in a thousand. Yeah, I would say one in a million. You know, there's seven billion people on this earth, and for the people that can do what these guys do at the level they do it under the conditions they do it, I mean, I don't know if it's one in a million. It's extraordinary. But, like, that could be, yeah, that could be debated, right. That could be debated, but so it's one of many, um, and. So in order for anybody to get to that level of surfing, which continues to to elevate over time, right? The performance of professional surfing is only advanced, evolved like other sports, right? Um, You need more people doing it. And so not just to serve the the, the professional sport of surfing would we want more people surfing, but like just just from a numbers game, it's like you need more people doing it so you can have more people able to do it at the level that we're talking about. Um, um, But generally, um, we believe that the surfing lifestyle is the key to happiness. I mean, clearly we think, you know. That's what I was going to say. That's to me is like reason alone. Um, and yet, no, reason, reason number one is like, you know, people are generally more happy when know, they're doing something uh, they love and they're connected to the ocean and the that we environment in, and, and have other. a healthy outlet um, to experience the world. And that's what we believe surfing does for people. And we actually know it does that for people. And so the more people that can participate in that, um, the more people we have in our tribe of like-minded, you know, uh, folks who are mindful about the environment that we live in and each other. Um, I, so I, I think that's- really, yeah, like I, I really like the, uh, the focus on sustainability, just like outside of the growth marketing side, like just the focus of the ocean. I mean, that's to me has been, um, you know, obviously something that that's embedded in what you do. What would be surprising that you support that nobody really knows about or know little about? Because I'm sure there's a lot of initiatives that are not as visible as like your um, initiatives around helping the ocean uh, be sustainable. Well, something I think we're really proud of is like our work with indigenous groups around the world that we're trying to, to, to elevate and, and give more um, time and resource to. Um, I think it's very important for us to be connected to the indigenous culture in Australia, New Zealand, um, certainly the, the Hawaiian community um, out on the islands uh, in Hawaii, and even even some of the indig- indigenous groups here in the United States that we celebrate when we go to places like Trestles, etc. We can always do more to to be more inclusive um, with the, with those communities and make sure that um, our fans and um, our viewers really know about that work. Um, and I think you'll see us elevate that more and do more around that this year. Um, and so I think that as well as, you know, just our, 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 our work around inclusion and equality. Um, I think people do know about it and it is happening, but you know, this year we launched our first pride Jersey ever. I was super excited about that. And when we went to the surf ranch and we put up our 12, you know, I don't know if it was 12, 12 flags of the countries competing, you know, sort of in homage to their Olympic journey. Like we stopped and made sure we had a pride flag up, you know, and that we're telling kids around the world that you can be different and you can be a professional surfer. You're welcome here. Um, and, you know, that to me is really important. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work around, like I said, equality, inclusion, um, and, and, and diverse communities that I think we can elevate and do more um, and, and um, you know, get more people involved in. Um, I also think that we want to get more diversity to the water, uh, make the lineup more inclusive itself, you know, in, in all different parts of the world get, and get more people exposed to swimming in the ocean and ocean health and its impact on the climate. Um, 
And I think that's uh, another you know thing that we will be working on as well as, like I mentioned, there are other communities um, like the adaptive surf community, um, as I used as an example earlier, that are, are important to our ecosystem that need to be recognized and included. I love that. I think inclusion, transparency are part of sustainability because, you know, for people to see their future through you as a business, um, you know, far too often we, there's been this part of marketing has been, you know, presenting the ideal. And I think there's something to be said about presenting what's real versus the ideal. Yeah. And I see a lot of brands like now shifting, right? Like now, now trying to present a, a stronger view of reality. Um, and I think that is important. I think that's important to kids to see those messages and for, you know, us all to see ourselves in the world. Um, and I, I, I hope that's here to stay and that's not just a, a fad. It doesn't seem like it is. Um, well, I think it was intentionality is what's the, is what the piece that is the underlying text of businesses that are doing it. You know, if their intention is real, then it's going to stay. If it's not, they're doing it just to basically greenwash or, or if you want to call it greenwashing, like they're just basically trying to be on trend, which I think is despicable um, because they're viewing it as a parlor trick. Right. Um, yeah. And that is the, that's the piece that kind of grinds me the most is that it just, lean in and own what you own, like be what you need to be and just own it. Well, and embrace your consumers because nobody had, I mean, very few businesses have like homogenous consumers in this world, right? Mm -hmm. Like embrace your consumers and, and, and recognize them and speak to them authentically, I think is, is that message. Um, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting balance for brands. And as somebody who deals with a lot of brands, I really do. Um, I, I do like to, to, to recognize progress. Um, and I know that's hard. Um, we have some folks at the league and in other organizations that are, are very sensitive to things like greenwashing um, and, you know, marketing ploys and maybe alternate intentions. But I think that we need to encourage people to make progress. Um, environmental, environmentalism to me reminds me a little bit of, I, I like to use this analogy and it's not perfect, like, because it's so much more important to, to be aware of environmental issues than my analogy will suggest. However, it's sort of like exercise in the sense of like, if you're at all unsure of what you should be doing or uh, unaware of the implications of your behavior on environment, uh, on the environment, or, or those around you, or even maybe shameful about some of the things you do. Sometimes it stops you from doing anything. And, you know, that, that's how I feel about exercise sometimes. Like, you know, if, I, if I'm not where I should be, then I'm doing nothing. Um, and that's not the right answer. Um, and so I, I think we have to leave space for people to participate um, and meet, meet us where they are and continue to step forward. Because if everybody continues to step forward, no matter where they start, we will be in a better place. And then, of course, there are some businesses that just don't belong in business because their practices are no good and they are just contributing um, too greatly to the problem. That I put aside. Um, but assuming that that's not the, the, the group of people we're talking about. Yeah. That makes total sense. I love that. Like, that's a very empathetic view and very practical at the same time, right? And that progress is better than uh, absolutism. Um, you know, it's not so black and white, you know, for businesses, for people, for, for anything in the world. And I think that's probably that tolerance is, is probably a great lesson, you know, for sustainable thinking. Right. Absolutely. And so like we do things like beach cleanups and, and, and all kinds of, um, initiatives, um, some of which are much bigger and have, have uh, more, let's say, political impact. But, you know, I've heard people say, like, why are we doing this beach cleanup? Like, is anybody really going to get anything out of this? And or, like, who's benefiting from this? And, you know, we're over here in, I don't know, make it up Malibu. And I always say, okay, yeah, we can, we can absolutely 
try to do something more robust and more impactful. Let's talk about that if that's the you know intention. But I think that when you change when when you create content or you know bring people together to become mindful about an issue and they actually take some action and you know leave with a a, a general alignment on how they're going to proceed um, and help provide some of the information to to folks who are maybe meeting at a different place like I think those things are important it's 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 um, grassroots yes um, and you know maybe not attacking the issue at scale um, but how do you take grassroots initiatives and create messages at scale um, and you build a groundswell you build a groundswell <laughs> see full circle here so tell me I, I have to ask you a couple questions just because sure. like you're a marketing guru we have a you know we have a global sports league that keeps me up all night thinking about all these things. Like mm-hmm. what would you do if you were me or like what, what kinds of things would you be thinking about in terms of sustainable growth um, for surfing specifically? Where do you think the opportunities are? And is there something you think we haven't thought of? Well, that's a really deep question. You know, obviously I'd love to ponder, ponder that a little bit, but you know, I think at the core, sustainable growth marketing, it's about how do you make every piece of energy, effort, and activity equal like one plus one equals three? How do you, how do you, and and how can you make a long term play and not affect the short term impacts? So, like you mentioned it before, like I have this, I have a short term reality, but I also got to think of the long term. So, you know, one of the areas that I don't know if it's like you're doing it or not doing, I'm not suggesting that, but as a way of thinking is how can you turn and transform people who are, are your audience and they bring in other people. And Mm -hmm. to me, that is the key because if you can change them with a story, with an insight, I believe I love the storytelling because some of your fans are not surfers. That's not really the point. It's that they might be 80 years old and going, this is incredible. I wish I did, or I did before. Um, Mm -hmm. How can that person feel that they're transformed through your, your platform because it's congruent with who they are. It, they feel like they're human and connected to you and they want to get someone else and go, Hey, you really need to see this Mm -hmm. to me. That is that the essence of that conversation guiding how you create content, organize, um, recycle content or create inclusion or pathways. That to me is, is the path of of building a groundswell. Well, and it sounds like it's a lot about community, right? Like, and what are the benefits of being part of this community? Um, you know, and some of them are, are, are maybe real tangible and some may be real spiritual even, you Mm -hmm. know? And, I, I think that's you're on to something and how do we communicate the benefits of being part of this community and growing this community um, to the world? Um, Cause it is, it's more than just a community of folks who love to watch people surf at an elite level. Um, it is a community of people who love the ocean and honor um, the environment and, you know, really passionately connect to the the sport and the, the all that it offers to them, whether it's free or competitive. Um, yeah. So like my, my thought here is how do I, how do you transform people from being an audience consuming content to participating? Not just like a fan, just necessarily like, um, like a, a fantasy um, where they feel that their involvement by being somehow interacting with you, um, you know, the the Hawaiians that that are, you know, on the beach and, and the surf contest that's there, they feel that, you know what, I'm not Hawaiian, but man, would I love to be able to be connected to it or learn more about the, the fall into the history of where surfing started or the indigenous, you know, beach that this is on, what, what happened years before and how we got here, like, and I somehow can contribute to 
something. Connecting to those people, connecting to helping them each remain safe and, and clean or, or protecting an indigenous community. I don't know. I mean, does that make sense? Like, I feel like there, that's where the sustainability is because I'm no longer consuming. And it's like, that's a repeatable thing. Like, oh, I got to eat again. Where rather I'm bought in. I'm now mm-hmm. part of this. It's what's, buying versus what's, bought in. That's what I call it. Yeah, yeah. And I was just saying, what's the, what's the, what, so then what's our new word for consuming? Like, what would we rather? Um, obviously, being bought in is, is, is probably where you're headed. But I, I think you're onto something there completely. Yeah, um, you know, it's like my second episode, it's humans, not customers, right? Like reframing, you know, uh, that. But in this case, it's how can I be that person and feel like, I'm like a virtual surfer Uh, because that, that word means something means a traveler means love for the ocean. You know, like it's like, I really understand the true meaning of Stoke, but I'm in Wisconsin. I'm landlocked and I can appreciate that because that was me. I'm from Canada. I dreamed of like, you look at that little red surfboard behind me there. Like that was when I was like 11 living in the Philippines. And my dad and I made a hollow surfboard because of surfing. But I, that was the only time I lived near the ocean that in California. But when I was in Canada, I would, I loved high school. I was just dreaming about going surfing. I just wanted to move to the North shore, which I did after I went to high school. But you know, for me, that is what I felt removed. I felt that through the magazines, that was my only connection, but I was an observer. And when I saw the movie North shore, it scared me. Cause I'm like, I'm going to a place where I'm not probably going to be liked, but there's something about this place that I just feel like I had to go. And I had my experience with living in Hawaii and, and, and And the culture there. Um, But I believe now we're a more global world where people want to tap in, not just view. So I think you're right. I think we need to come up with a word that changes the word audience into something else. I think you're right. I think you're um, right. And I think what I always say to people, it's an identity and, and it's and, and what you know, very you related to what you're, to you're describing is that identity is, is the difference sacred, between right? like it's, our fans and maybe we work other on this fans. our whole lives. Like, like even not owning my identity for the better part of 40 something years. Don't tell anybody a pastime. Um, it's an identity. But and, and so um, I think that's a yes. special right? place that we it's need an identity to, and, 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 and what you honor. choose to hold as um, your own personal identity engage is, is very sacred, um, right? Like, and it's, it's, you know, it obviously we work on this our whole lives. Some, like I've been spirit. honing my identity for the better part of 40 something years. Don't tell anybody how old I am. Um, but right. And so I think that's a special place that we need to, to respect and honor um, and engage. Um, and it, you know, it obviously has some, some, you know, spiritual connections as well. And that's, that is the other thing that's really cool with this is that there, someone's yearning for this connection to the water, to the universe, to this excitement, to these people, to Stoke. And I feel like that word Stoke is about energy, positive energy, happiness. And I feel like, you know, it's like, that's what you're, that's what you should be is like, you're not, you're not dealing in eyeballs. You're dealing in Stoke. Ooh, Ooh, Ooh. I like that a lot. Um, it was funny. I was on a, like a, a regular business panel and somebody said to me, what the hell is Stoke? And like, just off the top of my head, I was like, well, it's joy. Like, I mean, Stoke is joy. It's like the, 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 the emotion that is unbridled and positive and happy and it gives you um, and fulfills and sustains you um, through difficult times. Um, but I think that's what I would say Stoke is if, if I were to just, you know, kind of mm-hmm. like. And you can experience it, it for someone else. Watching, I, I was watching the 100 foot wave. I was stoked he made the wave. I'm like, oh my gosh, like I was stoked for him. I felt right, stoked. Right. right. So maybe, maybe what we're also saying is we need to create an outlet and a platform for fans to share their stoke. Right? Express it so they can grow it. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that's, that's definitely true. The cultivation um, of it. Yeah, and, and there couldn't be anything stronger um, to hold us together. 
Um, so that's, that's something I'm going to think a lot about after this conversation. Yeah. It's like you're creating a, a Stoke community or a Stoke, you know, nation, you know, really it's a different, it's a different, it's like, I like the word nation because it has no, a nation doesn't have to have a boundary. Right. Mm-hmm. Or, it was like a nation can live across like the indigenous nation is can be in across multiple indigenous tribes. Right. So, um, because I feel like that's what connects us. Like I can go as you've been seen, right? Like different places, you you both share a wave. You may not know this person, but you instantly get the stoke when they caught a wave, and you're looking at them and so forth. And I, that's what I wish for other people when I get people to try surfing. That's why I like the mission of get as many people surfing because that word. Some people have been happy, but they have never been stoked. And then they yeah, kind of and- don't understand why I use the word stoked when I get all like like a little kid. It's because that little energy ball of excitement is filled with possibility and sort of like freedom. I was just going to say that word because I heard Kai Lenny talk about Stoke in, in a number of interviews. And when I heard him talk about it and, you know, what happens to his brain when he's in the middle of a massive swell and it becomes so singly focused and, you know, the rest of the world where it kind of dissipates um, is freedom, right? Like it's freedom from all the other challenges of the world and complete connection with your environment. Um, and I think that's, those are sort of some of the elements of Stoke, right? My definition is a beautiful state that's an elevated state of gratitude in the moment. I love that. I love that. Doesn't it feel that way? It does. And (laughs) I'm kind of stoked now. Like, I'm glad I did this. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you did too. I'm so nice to get to know you. I mean, I feel like this is, we definitely have to have a part two because I feel like, you know, we could just dive into a bunch of different things and I can see we're we're topping the hour. I don't even care if this is a two hour podcast, so we could keep going, but I want to be respectful of your time because I did only ask for an hour. Um, If I could, you know, ask you on this topic, because you asked me, you know, what I would do, you know, what would you say to anyone listening about how they could become part of this? Like, like, even though we're, sorry, my, that must be the bell ringing. It's my, my my computer, but what would you say to them to go, what could they do in a business to create Stoke? Oh, what could you do in a business? To your employees, to your, to your, you know, Because you're dealing with it directly. You're seeing the athletes. You're seeing this. And most people don't understand this, right? What could be something that you think could translate? I mean, this is a hard question. I don't know if you can do this. but I mean, this is another quote that sticks out in my head. Because if you saw my Instagram, I love quotes. My my, my young son is like, Mom, enough with the quotes. Um, But if you create the conditions for magic to happen, um you know, you, you might just get some stoke. Um, and so like you can't always, um, you know, orchestrate perfect conditions, but, um, you can organize around really good conditions to create authenticity, freedom, uh, freedom of thought, creativity, um, other sort of expressions of stoke. And so I think as a leader, uh, if I was ever an owner of a company or, uh, you know, the leader of a business, um, creating the conditions for people to feel more freedom, feel more creativity, feel more um, joy um, in in their daily lives and and be able to bring their whole full selves um, and most authentic selves, I think, is kind of where I would say it's at. I would agree. And I would, I would sort of finish with this. I believe, and this is no coincidence that we're having this conversation is Stoke is its own form of sustainable growth because it comes from a pure energy source that you just, you have the more stoked you get, more stoked you get. It just feeds on itself. And um, so what you just described in my mind is just, it's a bit of a little heady conversation. It's about energy and about creating a state of energy through these magical moments by doing so, this in itself is a sustainable – it has a, a never-ending well of potential when people are in this state. And I think that we've lost that art 
of of realizing that what we do in life in work is interconnected. It's not I go to work and and uh, you know and then I go and, and experience joy elsewhere. And I think the younger generation has it right. They're asking the hard questions. Why? Why are we doing this? And I, I really applaud the young generation because I feel like they have a better sense of what didn't work and they're more interested in experiences than they are things. They're more asking, why am I part of this company? And you're hearing all these businesses that have employees that are um, standing up because they want their company to represent their values. And I think this is this groundswell that's happening that is really leaning into some of the work you're doing and what I think is going on in the world. So, you know, that's my two cents. (laughs) Yeah. And I think just to bring that full circle, like I feel incredibly proud of being sort of a, a, a positive energy source of energy and light in the world during what has been a very challenging, you know, a uh, year and a half. And I know that we have brought more stoke into the world. I see it on the smiles of the athletes and I can see it on the comments from the fans. And I can, um, I, I can, I can tell by the kids at the beach. Um, and so I, I, I think that that is something we need to hold dear. And like you said, stoke even more in greater magnitude um but yeah i think i think i agree with all of that and i also think that um having a 12 and a 13 year old and watching them grow up and be more inclusive and be more um environmentally mindful um from very young ages gives me a lot of hope like and i'm the eternal optimist um and i i am very hopeful uh, that the next generation will will carry us forward, and is listening and watching to to how we are um, adding more purpose to our lives and elaborating on important conversations regularly. So I, I'm I'm hopeful. I love it. Thank you so much for being on my show. Really, oh, thank you for inviting me. This is me. such it's a fun. great surprise. Maybe I'll come back and maybe I'll bring a guest with me. We'll do something fun. Well, yeah, we'll we'll think of a couple other collaborations, and uh, you know, I definitely want to have you back again. Um, and again, everyone that's listening, um, this has uh, been such an honor. If you could just share with everybody where they can find you and follow you, and and whatever you like to share with them. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm on Instagram, uh, just Cherie Cohen, C H E R I E C O H E N. I'm public, whatever. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn where I'm also Sheree Cohen and you can find me there. Um, I'm not doing too much Facebook these days. I just don't have a ton of time. Um, but that's, that's where you can kind of find me, but, um, or you can find me at the world surf league. If you, if you look hard enough, I'll be here. Love it. Thank you again. And thank you everyone for listening. That concludes another amazing episode of the ground soil origins podcast now um as before if you just want to give me some feedback uh voicemail just go into groundswell.fm there's a voice drop there you can just hit record and leave me a voicemail i love it until next time mahalo mahalo